you have with the Arabic language. You, if you want to talk about something which is a big taboo, you prefer uh -huh. to use English or French, at least in Lebanon. Do you, do you get more or less reactions? When yes, you, write you do, you do. Yeah. And this is one of signs of hypocrisy because it's the same words. And then I thought, I'm just being a coward. I mean, I know that French is a language that I love, but I'm just being a coward. And when I first wrote my a text of mine yeah. in Arabic, I always, um, uh, you know, compare it, compare the text to a battle scene. You could see the blood, you could see the dead people uh, on the paper because it was like a big fight, a big war that I was doing because I wanted to force this language that was uh, telling me not to say these things, I wanted to force her to say these things, the, the things that I felt, the things that I thought, the things w that was my right to say and think and feel and express. So it hasn't been easy, but then uh, I started uh, feeling, you know, um, uh, not victorious, but yeah. each text, each poem that I, w that I wrote and uh, in which I named the things that I wanted to name yeah. with their own names was like a small victory. And and of course, metaphors are uh, a part of the writing game, but in my writing, I decided to avoid metaphors because it is uh, it was a political stance in my case to be able to say the breast yeah. is a breast and the penis is a penis. But as yeah. if that wasn't enough, you started to, to uh, publish a, a glossy erotic magazine, yes. Just Hard, exactly. The Body. It is, um, um, how do you see the role of the body in the emancipation of women? Oh, it's one of the main, you know, I, I think that uh, the em emancipation of women uh, relies on three main uh, uh, pillars. One of them is, of course, uh, a, a liberation from religion. Mm -hmm. because, and I'm talking here about the monotheist religions. We, um, <clears throat> I have studied them and my next book, they're going to, to have a large part in my next book, the one I'm writing now. Yeah. The three monotheist religions have played a big part in, um, uh, you know, uh, treating women as an accessory or putting them in a second position. If you just go back to the story of the creation, the woman is just the rib. She is a tiny part of the whole which is masculine. And uh, so the, that was, th this is the first thing, at least fight for secularism. If you're not fighting for um, an anti-religious or a liberation from religion, at least fight for secularism. The second part is, of course, uh, um, uh, sexuality, because sexuality has always been used as a tool to uh, oppress women. And here, when I say oppress, I'm not talking only about the woman wearing a burqa. Yeah. Because to me, the, the woman wearing a burqa and treated uh, as, a, as an instrument of temptation, which needs to hide itself in order to protect the man from being, uh, you know, uh, tempted, uh, is no different f than the woman who accepts to be treated like a piece of meat or who is treated like a piece of meat, whether in magazines or in advertisement, yeah. or also in her own gaze towards herself. So she has to redefine. That's also patriarchal, you know, uh, stance. Oh. That's also patriarchal oppression because she is not seeing herself. She is seeing with her own eyes. She is seeing herself and assessing herself with the eyes of the patriarchal yes. authority. So that, that's a second very important thing. And of course, the third thing is fighting for education and economical independence, because that is a big tool to give power for women. It's important for the woman to believe in herself, to, believe, to have a career, to believe that she has the right to dream of and to have ambitions and to long for something more than just waiting for the right husband. But you're addressing yourself now to women like you <coughs> in the Arab world, not to the um, what, what to the image that we have, the oppressed burqa clad women that, that are in to me, no precision to, to, to make a lot of changes in their she life. Can. She, she can. She can. And I'm going to give you one small example of how a woman in a burqa can do a lot, at least to help the next generations. Mm -hmm. And she's not doing that. And this is why I put a, a big responsibility on women, not only in the East, not only in the Arab world, but in the West as well. Like, for example, this woman who is, uh, uh, you know, deprived of so many rights is usually told, your only place is the house. You can educate your kids. You can raise them, you can cook, you can take care of the house, and that's your kingdom, and that's it. Well, most of these women complain about their lives, and then they raise their daughters to be the same as them, to be future victims. Yeah. They don't give them this thirst 
for something more, for something better. And it's enough to just give them a small glimpse of what, how life could be so much more interesting if they wanted more for themselves than just getting married at 14 years old. Yes. And they also raise their sons to be as misogenic, as humiliating towards women as their own husbands, fathers, brothers, uh, etc. So they're not doing enough. And but at motherhood time, is a great power, you know. And in the same time, the society, of course, has to redefine itself, be helping it out, because women alone cannot... Maybe. Of course, but it all starts, you know, you cannot say, I'm going to wait for society yeah. or for lawyers or for the legal system to do something. Yeah. You should start your own, taking care of your own small garden, and then things will will come together. Yeah, so, yeah, some people say that your style is quite provocative or radical even. Do you think that you need you need that to be effective in the change you want to make? I don't think so. I don't think, I mean, I know that I'm, I'm described as provo provocative and I don't mind that, but it's not my target. You know, I always say that provocation is just a collateral damage of who I am. I'm just being who I am. I'm being uh, truthful to my thoughts, to my ideas, and to also my belief in my, in my human rights, mm -hmm. you know, so, and by exercising these rights, I am being provocative, at least uh, uh, in the region where I come from, and sometimes to other parts of the world as well. But I'm not seeking provocation as such. Sometimes it's important to shock others, but you have to go beyond the superficial shock. You need to seek the deep earthquake, and this is something that I seek in my writings. Yeah, can you describe the sacrifices that you had to make to, for enacting your beliefs? You know, I never think of them as sacrifices. Sometimes people tell me that I'm courageous or that I'm paying a big price. I know that I'm pay paying a big price. What, what one, price one, are you one, paying? One of, the, one of the prices is, of course, uh, the social ostracism that sometimes I'm subjected to. You know, I'm very much... Um, a recent article about me was entitled The Most Hated Woman in Lebanon, for example. Do I care? I really don't, and I honestly don't. Why? Be not because I, I don't uh, consider criticism or I don't recognize criticism. This is beyond criticism. I love criticism when it's coming from people I trust, when it's coming from people who I know are criticizing me for my own good. But I cannot be affected by it when it's coming from people who are trying to um, uh, uh, stop me from doing the things that I believe in. So I just... Instead of, let's say I receive um, 50 emails every day, 25 are insults and threats and, um, you know, uh, um, uh, any kind of uh, intimidation. And 25 are messages of support and, uh, and uh, encouragement uh, and love. I always focus on the 25 positive messages and this is what keeps me going on. It's yeah. not my courage, it's my passion, it's also my faith that at the end of the day, I'm not imposing my convictions on you, I'm just practicing them and this is my basic right. You yeah. can either, you know, ignore this book or this magazine or my poetry or my ideas or you can embrace them. You're free to do that as much as I'm free to express them. Yeah, you, you say in this book that you think that Arab uh, women in, in the Arab countries are not doing enough to, um, to change their state. But um, in, the, in, the, in the changes that we've seen and the revolutions in the last couple of years in, in the Arab world, I do see women, I do see a hopeful image of, um, of the woman in that revolution. Do you think it has changed anything for the position? Well, I'm sorry I'm going to have to disappoint you, but um, as much as I was proud um, at the beginning of the revolutions, mm -hmm. let's take the Tunisian and Egyptian examples, as much as, as much as I was proud and hopeful, as much as I was also skeptical and, and uh, scared. Why? Because one way for me to measure uh, 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 the change of a certain country from dictatorship uh, towards a real democracy or a positive, um, you know, a positive situation or structure yeah. is the situation of women in that country and the role that is given to them or that the role that they take because a woman should never say this this world is mine give it to me the woman should should say this world is mine I'm gonna take it that's that's what I believe in so we have all seen women 
like you said, participate mm -hmm. in the uh, in the revolutions at the moment of the visible, uh, um, you know, level of the revolutions, uh, contribute in in the demonstrations, etc. But then, at the moment of the formation of the new structures, they have almost disappeared. Few voices were heard. Women were subjected to t virginity tests. I once heard a lawyer, in, an Egyptian lawyer on TV. Uh, uh, lecturing women on how a woman was not created to participate in the political life of her country. How many women in the new governments that were formed in Tunisia and, and Egypt? Very few, maybe one or two or three at the maximum. But is it possible? So this means they were just used as instruments to give credibility to a popular movement and then they were put aside especially now with the integralist, uh, religious integralist threat. So it's unfortunate that in the Arab world we are mm, uh, uh, many times forced to use between um, to, to choose between one monster and another monster, and this is what happened. But at the same time, it is necessary for people to experience now the ugliness of the religious extremist regime in order for them, for maybe in 20 years, move towards a very positive, a real yeah. positive change. Then how, if, 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 if women for, for, the, for the next few years, well, I, I don't think you believe that they, they are able to, to, to take their role in, in politics. No, and, not and, when a woman yeah. is advertising for her for a seat in the parliament with a picture of a rose instead of her own picture because she cannot put her picture. This happened in Hizb Noor in Egypt. Yeah. So it's absurd. What are you talking about? And Who then, am I choosing? And where do you see, do you see any hope then? I see a hope, like I said, it's definitely bound to change. We cannot keep on going backwards. I'm, I'm saying that, of course, the, the Arab world has been falling and falling for the past uh, century. And we have not hit rock bottom yet, but we are going to hit yeah. rock bottom. These revolutions are not the new start. The new start is going to happen after people experience, like I said, how horrible it is to live under a religious extremist regime, which is no better than a dictatorship. Both are terrible. And they will and find then that out soon. They will find that out, and then they will really start seeking a new dignity for themselves. And this is what it is. This is what being a human being is all about, yeah. believing in your own dignity. Do you think, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm asking it on a deeper level, so not um, <coughs> that, that we can drive when we want and that we dress how we want, but do you think that Western women uh, have achieved more? You know, I have, I have always looked upon Western women uh, for, I mean, like when I see the fight uh, that Western women have done in the 60s and the early, uh, late 50s and the 60s for women's rights everywhere. And of course, that was a big example for me. I call myself a post-feminist, by the way, and not a feminist for many reasons, but that was a major thing in the formation of my own philosophy and the way I, I look at life. Mm -hmm. But then what, what really... Uh, uh, scares me now or worries me is that in, in many Western countries women have become so relaxed that they think that it's not important to fight anymore. We so have so won a, this. A superficial feminist. Exactly. And not only that, it's like you have to wake up every morning and go to war. If you don't do that, you don't stay at the place where you have arrived. You go backwards. And this is the real threat in the Western world now. The feeling that uh, you take all these rights for granted and you don't fight for them anymore. You know, this book has been published in 13 different countries yeah. and in many European countries where I thought, why would people read it? They cannot relate. Maybe they would read it out of curiosity. And you cannot imagine how women in Norway or in Germany or in, 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 the, in, in the Netherlands have come to me after my talks and told me how they related to my speech. So we speech. all have still a bit We all fight. have issues. So um, one of the things, one definition about yourself that you uh, actually like is being a poet. It's the only definition I accept. <laughs> exactly. So maybe it's a good idea that we could end this night with a poem of yours, reading it out for our viewers so they have something to think about before they go to sleep. Yeah, so Thanks. I give you, well, you know it by heart, know it by heart and you do it in Arab, in Arabic. عندما أجلس أمامك أيها الغريب أعرف كم تحتاج إلى الزمن كي تردم المسافة إلي أنت في أوج الذكاء وأنا في أوج المأدبة أنت تفكر كيف ستبدأ 
حديث المغازلة وأنا تحت ستار وقاري أكون قد فرغت من التهامك That sounded beautiful. Thank, Thank you very you. much for being Thank here. Thank you so Shimon much. Hada. Dit was het gesprek op twee. Volgende week dan zit hier Chris Keijnen en hij praat met Morris Glassman, de Engelse baron die de Labour Partij nieuw leven wil inblazen met oude ideeën. En ik hoop dat u dan weer kijkt. Voor nu, een hele fijne nacht. Thank you very much.